Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am here with one of my favorite, a, a good friend of mine, Michael Kramer of Mott Capital Management. He also has a great Seeking Alpha and new Substacks, and he has a great YouTube channel um, with excellent charts. So Michael, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? Great. I'm so excited to be talking about macro and markets with you today. It's been, uh, I think, about a month and a half or so since we last met. So right. let's let's start with earnings, you know, um, and what's been going on. My thoughts, you know, are that they're better than expected, but really not that good. What are your thoughts? Pretty much the same. Um, they're certainly better than feared but they're still pretty bad. <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, you know, the the S&P 500, I was just looking before, and I'll see if I can pull it up and share it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, you have about 450 companies that have reported results, and I'll, I can share it right now with you. Sure, we love it. I always love your analysis. Um, so here you can see that, um, you have 443 companies that have reported out of 500 and uh, sales surprises about 2.7%. So that's roughly in line with what we've seen in prior quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, sales estimates are, sales are beating estimates by about 6.7%. And that's higher than what we've seen in recent quarters. Um, but the, the bad part, I guess, is that, you know, you've seen sales growth of only 4.3%, which doesn't sound very good given that mm -hmm. inflation's running, I don't know, close to five or so. Yes. Uh, and really in the first quarter, higher than five. And then you have earnings growth, which have declined by 3.3%. And if you see, that's just as bad as the fourth quarter. And so what's interesting is that sales growth has come down from call 5.8% to 4.3%. Uh, and earnings, you know, have continued to decline. And this difference is sort of your margin compression in mm -hmm. between. Mm -hmm. um, and so the results just aren't, I mean, yeah, they're better than feared, but they're not good. And you can see that the second quarter we're looking for right now about a almost a 7% decline in earnings in the second quarter wow. and a negative uh, sales growth rate. Wow. And yeah, and these numbers are nominal, mm -hmm. not real. And like you said, you need to factor in that high inflation. I mean, over 5% is high. So um, definitely right. not good um, at all. You know, and if you look at these numbers just in terms of how they've been trending, I mean, they've been they've been trending as you would expect, and that's lower. Um, if you look at the, yeah. you know, the earnings estimate revisions, mm -hmm. Uh, or actually cast a time series. Um, you know, if you look at the third quarter, for example, you can see that they've been coming down every, you know, every week. Um, and and essentially, I mean, what you're seeing is just that the numbers just aren't as good as, you know, people make it out to seem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It seems that they keep revising lower. So and they get to a point where if you've revised low enough, you're going to be beating and it's going to look better, but it's not really better. It's actually worse. Well, and that's the funny thing. Exactly what happened in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. You can see that the numbers came all the way down. Yeah. We got down to about $50 and 60 cents at the end of March. And now you can see they've had a big revision higher again, mm -hmm. but that's because, you know, obviously the estimates were, you know, pushed too far, you know, to the downside. And, um, Again, when you're looking out to the second quarter and whatnot, if I can pull this up, you know, you'll see that, you know, these numbers are also being revised lower. And, you know, here you can see the second quarter now has been revised to a new low. The third quarter is revised to a new low. The fourth quarter is basically back to its lowest points. Um, and when we look at the full year, oops, wrong one. Um, when mm -hmm. we look at the full year, yeah, uh, you can see that those numbers have been, you know, trending lower as well. So it's just, you know, the, the whole thing here is, you know, where is 2024 going to be? Yes. Because if 2024 is actually going to be a 242, then, you know, maybe you could start making an argument that, 
you know, the market's not really that badly priced, but if, if, if these numbers are going to be down the two twenties, then that's, that's going to be a major issue. And you can see the trend has obviously been lower. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, you know, how much lower are these numbers going to go? Exactly. And that's, and that's the real question because we just don't know, you know, recession was supposed to hit in the, in the first half of the year. Now it's not going to hit, you know, it doesn't seem like it's going to hit till maybe the second half of the year, but yes. the, probably the second half of the year, you're going to be talking about maybe the first half of 2024. Mm -hmm. It's been very slow. It's getting mm -hmm. dragged out. We've had a sideways market. I, I loved your video on that with the S&P 500. You're like, it's about 4,100, 4,200, that 4,000 range. And it's been sideways. And uh, will it continue with that sideways grind? You know, we're more in a stagflation period than we are a recession. Yeah, stagflation, um, absolutely. The recession may come at some point down the road, but mm -hmm. right now this is more of a we're stagflation, in stagflation um, where you're getting this sort of nominal GDP growth rate that's you know around five ish percent on a seasonally adjusted annualized rate, and you mm -hmm. have you know a price index that was at four percent, so you're getting a real growth rate of about one point one, and mm -hmm. I mean that to me is just stagflation, um, and you know, the biggest problem that the economy is really facing is still high prices. And, you know, and so I, I don't know, I mean, again, if we get recession, you know, like we did in the first half of, of last year, I mean, a lot of people don't really consider it a recession, mm -hmm. but we did have two negative quarters yes. of GDP. And, you know, typically that was sort of the definition, but Obviously, the reason why it was negative was because the price indexes were, you know, through the roof, eight, nine percent. And that was making the negative GDP prints. Um, and so I, it just seems to me like, you know, as long as you have a nominal growth rate still in that five to six percent rate region, it's hard to really talk about recession. And that's why mm -hmm. earnings have continued to be better than expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think stagflation, I think I've been talking about that since last year. And I think last time we met, we also spoke about that. You know, we just have this persistent low growth, you yeah. know, margins are compressed. And, um, you know, inflation is entrenched. And that's my opinion. It just seems to be very sticky in many elements. I mean, we still have wage inflation with that very tight labor market. And that read we got on Friday 3.4% unemployment. What are your thoughts over there? Um, so that number I thought was interesting because there was a lot of people that actually retired uh, uh, or left the labor force last month in the household mm -hmm. survey. And um, that's one of the reasons why you saw the unemployment rate fall so much. But then mm -hmm. again, in prior months when the unemployment rate came in higher than expected, it was because a lot of people who were on the sidelines went back into the labor force. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of that unemployment rate sort of been like a, a number that's just been bouncing around around 3.5% now for a couple of months. And I think it just, and, and really the, what I was surprised about was the wage growth number, because that was one of the hottest mm -hmm. wage growth numbers month over month we had seen in many months. And uh, the wage growth year over year was clearly a, change in trend right mm -hmm. um and so those were really the those two numbers were really much more surprising to me than the actual unemployment rate i know a lot of people focus on the non-farm payroll number mm. but to me that doesn't really mean much because again the, the important numbers that we really focus on are the ones that come from the household survey which are the labor participation rate the unemployment rate um uh, and things of, of the U6 measure of unemployment, uh, those are kind of the important ones. And those aren't, you know, non-farm payroll numbers. Those aren't establishment numbers. Those are household numbers. Yes. And so the household numbers continue to look really strong. And it's hard to, it's hard to say that, you know, um, I mean, based on those numbers that the Fed should be done. I, and, and so it speaks probably an economy that's probably still doing very well.
Yeah, definitely on a nominal basis. I mean, this wage growth is exactly, I, I was also looking at those numbers. I mean, with these higher wages, wage inflation, it just keeps fueling that nominal spending, which I think is driving the nominal demand. Um, you know, and, you know, there's, um, I agree with you and the way they collect the data with the household versus establishment, it really that non farm payroll that I think was 253 or something like that. Um, I don't really look at that number also as closely, but, um, you know, yeah, like the labor participation rate um, is down and we have so many issues there. You know, I like looking at the fill rate and the beverage curves, and um, those are very interesting numbers. But regardless, we know that the labor market is tight and inflation is persistently elevated and it's still rising month over month, although it's decelerated. If you look at Cleveland Fed, and I know you look at, I think it's, you look at Atlanta Fed as well, or do you look at other um, numbers? I look at all of them, yeah. You look at all of them, right? I, I just yeah. looked at, I just pulled up Cleveland Fed um, earlier and I saw we're going to go up, according to them, by 0.46% for core. I mean, that's still rising. And, you know, yeah. inflation is cumulative. So you have that factor with the tight labor market. I agree with you. I think the Fed continues its restrictive monetary policy and continues the rate hikes. But we see everywhere it's priced in a pause, I think, in June. You, you seeing that? Yeah. I mean, basically, we're, the market is expecting, uh, you know, the Fed is done and they're going to start cutting rates before the end of the year, 100 basis points. Maybe. I mean, I think that's that's pretty out there. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know how many more times the Fed's going to say they're not going to cut rates. I mean, they've said it consistently now, feels like for almost a year, but yet the market still is in this fantasy world where it thinks mm -hmm. that the Fed's be cutting rates. I mean, I can't think of a scenario where the Fed comes in and about faces and starts cutting rates and <laughs> think of it in a good way. Mm -hmm. right because okay. if the fed starts cutting rates when they've been telling everyone that they're going to keep them high for an extended period of time the only way that they start cutting them is if something has really gone wrong mm -hmm. you know or the economy falls off a cliff um and, and that's not going to be the type of environment that's going to make you know stock go up it's if anything it's going to you know you're going to see growth of earnings really deteriorate then um so, I mean, really the sort of like the way I've been sort of phrasing it is like the optimistic view that I have mm -hmm. um, is that the Fed won't cut rates and that will be in a stagflationary environment, you know, that that, you know, it will, you know, we'll have a couple more quarters of sort of this high inflation, low growth environment, maybe another year or two. And then finally, you know, things kind of just inflation is 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 subsided and maybe the fed can start you know really starting start maybe adjusting monetary policy to something lower that's more accommodative um instead of restrictive but i mean this idea that the fed's just going to have this massive turnaround and overnight it, it, to me would be a disastrous scenario I, I can't think of a scenario that would be positive from that standpoint Agree completely. I've been saying the same. I actually wrote an article in January on my website saying that we don't want a Fed pivot. You know, we don't. I mean, um, I think they should continue <clears throat> as, as you. And, you know, in in Powell's speech, there were a few words that that struck me. And one was data dependent. And yes. he's been saying that since last year. And we've talked about this numerous times. Um, and, you know, the data, it speaks for itself. And we do see inflation is highly elevated and it's very sticky. And, you know, per Deutsche Bank, they say once inflation's over 5%, it can take up to a decade to come back down. So we know there's some sticky elements in there and it's still accelerating, although by less, but it could reaccelerate. We don't know. And, um, and the reason why I think the pivot crowd believe that they're going to the Fed's going to change course is because something is breaking and they were banking literally banking on the banking crisis and you know Powell's first words out of his mouth were the banking system is sound and resilient what are your thoughts about those words 
Well, I mean, it was ironic that, right? you know, <laughs> that he says it and then like there's another bank that's potentially, you know, know. Kind of struggles the same day. But I mean, to this point, it's only been really a handful of banks out of what, I think there's what, over 4,300 banks in the country mm -hmm. or something. Um, and so there's been like three or four that have been sort of problematic. Um, it's a very small percentage, basically. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean that you can't have some sort of systemic risk, but, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, to this point, I mean, I think like, <laughs> I think it's kind of um, misunderstood to some degree because the difference between today and 10 or 15 years ago is that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, banks had assets on their books that we didn't know how, that they didn't know how to value. Mm -hmm. And there was counterparty risk because they were derivative contracts and they were, you know, there was buyer and then there was a seller, so to speak. Right. And there was someone holding the, 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 the uh, assets. And then there was, you know, the, the basket of assets underneath that, that basket, you know, in the, in the CD, in the, you know, mortgage backed securities and, and mm -hmm. such. And so, and the problem was, was that no one knew what they were worth. So they just all got written down to zero at the end of the day. And that, and that sort of really created the whole systemic issue. In this case, I mean, we're talking about treasury securities, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about, you know, what are they worth and how do we value them? And do we need to write them down to zero? It's about, you know, what they're worth today versus what, you know, the, the yeah. loss you have on them, yeah. but they're not Until zero. Maturity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, but they're not zero. So they, they're, they're going to have a value and, you know, you certainly don't worry about, you know, the counterparty risks that may be out there. Um, so it's just a different type of scenario. And I just tend to think that it's sort of gotten blown out of proportion to some degree because everyone still has these fresh memories of 2008 in their yes. mind, but you know, it's just a different type of, it's a different type of problem. And to this point, I think the Fed has, and, and the Treasury has done a good enough job of making sure that these issues stay contained and that there's a liquidity that's sufficient to make sure that these banks can, you know, operate or there's been, you know, at least buyers of them uh, in the term, in the, in the form of First Republic. Um, but I don't know. I just generally tend to think that it's been sort of blown out of proportion. It yeah. certainly doesn't help that you have these. I I don't understand. Like I was, <laughs> I was wondering a weekend or two ago, like where mm -hmm. all the spaces were on Twitter, you know, about how, you know, the, the banking crisis, because if you remember that first weekend yeah. and so <laughs> I mean, it was like, you know, Twitter space after Twitter space, yeah. like six hours of Twitter nonstop Twitter spaces with all these special speakers that were coming on out of the woodworks and and they were telling you about why they needed to do this and why they needed to do that mm -hmm. and why there's going to be this giant crisis in our hands. And it's like, well, what happened to all the, you know, what happened to that? You know, what happened to all those emergency Twitter spaces mm -hmm. we were having on Saturday and Sunday oh. nights? It, they all vanished, right? Yeah. It's so, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, unfortunately, we just live in a world where things get over dramatized too much. Agree. Yeah. Well said. I love, I love that. Um, you know, it's a totally different situation from 2008. We have liquidity solvency issues rather than that credit. And it's mostly due to, you know, unrealized losses in the sovereign bonds and mortgage back and, you know, treasuries. So if they held to maturity, it'd be fine. But it's these bank runs that they talk about um, with the smaller banks. And, you know, the smaller banks have the lowest insured deposit coverage ratios, so, you know, they're more at risk. And um, so, you know, we're seeing, you know, JP Morgan, you know, Jamie Dimon is stepping in and he's like the savior. And, and it seems like we're headed towards a banking oligopoly. So, you know, besides the, the KRE and the regional bank sector and all that, I guess my concern is about these banks uh, getting bigger. It's more branches, less banks. And I have to tell you, um, in my opinion, between us, I, I guess everyone's going to be hearing this anyways. 
I don't know who would keep their money at the smaller banks. I mean, I don't want to cause a bank run between our discussion here, but I mean, I bank at JP Morgan. Do you as well? Yeah, I mean, Chase, yeah. Chase, exactly. So yeah. it's like, um, you know, it's just a challenging thought. I guess, I guess, you know, they will be saved by Jamie Dimon. So, you know, he stepped in with First Republic. And I see that when I log into my account right across the top. First Republic is yeah. now part of Jace, you know? Right. So, um, but yeah, I agree. It's been blown out of proportion and, um, and it's not a banking failure um, as they want to have it be. I guess people just want some drama. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the banking oligopolies is a concern to me. And, uh, but, you know, I was going to ask you um, before I forget, um, do you think that, the Fed is because of the government spending and all the mass debt that we have, and even not at the higher rates and, and adding more debt, well, at the higher rates, not even adding more debt, just the current debt right now. And I know you showed a chart about the interest expense, um, I think once like a while back. Um, do you think that the Fed will, and they're going to have to print more money at some point, and we're going to go back to QE? Um, I personally think after this last mess, I think it'll be a long time before the Fed goes back to doing QE. Good. Um, okay. Because um, I think that this time they overdid it, and I mean, really, the big the big thing is that you had the QE on top of fiscal spending. Yes. And the combination of the two was just too much because, you know. If you go back and you look at the course of time, I mean, Japan's obviously been the bigger, biggest mm -hmm. abuser of quantitative easing mm -hmm. and their markets have not, they've struggled with inflation for years, right? 30 years, right? They, they couldn't get inflation up. They couldn't, their markets didn't really perform very well. I mean, if you look at the European markets during periods of QE, they didn't perform very well. And so you wonder like, you know, how much of QE really, how much QE really affects asset prices as much as it affects just, you know, risk taking in terms of the way it shifts the yield curve around. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what happened this time, because I wrote a, I wrote a, <laughs> I was talking to someone about this, but I had written many years ago when I first started, um, I had written a story in 2016 for the street.com mm. at the time. And I had noted Did that. You have to repost um, it. I want to read it. I don't know. It's like embarrassing to read it at this point. No. Um, but at that point, I had written that, you know, the reason why we were struggling with inflation and why we were unable to get inflation up at that point in time, because we were really sort of battling deflationary cycle was that um was because actually money supply was growing faster than mm. nominal gdp growth ah, i love this discussion i love where we're going and, and that and that pushed the velocity of money mm -hmm. down and so what happened with this episode mm -hmm. is that you had a very sharp deflation at the beginning of covid because you printed MZM went to like $23 trillion yes. overnight from all the physical spending and nominal growth was very slow to grow. So you actually got an MZM that went to below one. So basically the way I thought about it was like every 97 cents in money created it only, I mean, sorry, every dollar of MZM created, it only mm -hmm. created 97 cents in GDP mm. at the height of the inflation cycle in the 1980s. You know, you had almost every dollar created in MZM created three dollars and fifty five cents or something in GDP, and there was your inflation component, right? And and today we were on the opposite side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But then what happened was <coughs> MZM creation stopped, right? Mm -hmm. And M two growth stopped, mm -hmm. and now it's actually falling. Yes, and nominal GDP is still rising. Mm -hmm. So. So you're you're actually creating money. You need there's demand for a lot of money, but there's just not enough of it, and that's creating your inflation. You know, and um, and that's causing your velocity, your rate of change in the velocity to rise, and that's your inflation. And so, what I had written at that time 
was that, you know, the reason why we were struggling was because, M, you know, money supply was growing at a faster rate than the, the economy. And what the, what the government needed to do was to increase nominal GDP growth, mm -hmm. right? And to do that, you needed to do fiscal spending and they weren't doing it. And my other alternative was, well, if they're not going to increase, if they're not going to do physical spending, then we need to shrink the money supply. Mm -hmm. And and so sure enough, I mean, what the idea, what the what the concept was, was that there was there was too much money supply being created regularly, and there wasn't enough demand for all yeah. of it, so it wasn't really being utilized and used. It wasn't needed. And that was creating your deflationary force. And now we're in the exact opposite. So basically what I wrote in 2016 is exactly where we are today. That's brilliant. And, and, and so, and it, it really just goes back to that, that formula, you know, nominal, you know, velocity of money is right. just your, you know, your nominal growth rates of, of both of them, you know, and so that's where we are. That's exactly. I love that you went to this discussion because I this is a, what we wanted to talk about was velocity of money. And I think it's a, a very important topic. Um, and like you said, velocity is equal to the nominal GDP divided by the money supply. Right, so, whatever you use, right. Exactly. Now, let's talk about what, let's apply that formula like you just did to now. We're seeing the money supply, the denominator, go down and we're seeing GDP go up. So right. then the, the velocity of money right now is increasing. Right. I think it's about 1.2 or something. Okay. 1.2. Generally- but it went from, a, it went from yeah. a number below one though. Wow. Yeah. Because or, of what happened back in 2020. I'm getting, I'm just confused because there's the velocity of M2 and then there's the velocity of MZM. Okay. Which they don't, they don't produce- I don't, they don't produce MZM statistics anymore. Mm -hmm. So I oh, had yeah. to figure out how to recreate it. Okay. So it doesn't, let's just not worry about the numbers, but okay. the velocity of money, whatever it was, went below one. Mm -hmm. And now it's, let's say higher. higher. So that rate of change is what's creating the inflation. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the Fed is so focused on the demand side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they don't want to really shrink the money supply and suck, suck money out of or I should say they don't want to start. I should say if we back up, they don't want to probably start, you know, going down this process of creating more money again mm -hmm. because it will give the appearance that there's going to be more inflation, even though we yes. know probably the opposite. Mm -hmm. But what they are trying to do is, is bring nominal GDP growth down. Right. And that's the side of the equation they're trying to rebalance with the money supply. And, and when you do that, and when you start getting the velocity moving lower again, that will be your deflationary impulse. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly it. And now with a tight labor force that we have, that keeps fueling that spending, the demand, and that GDP. So that is fueling the inflation. So according to this formula, like you said, they want to bring down the demand, the nominal demand, the real the, the demand, period. And by that, then they'll be bringing down the velocity and thus bringing us into a more of a deflationary state. Or so, a more, hopefully more balanced, yeah. More balanced. Now, the money supply. They've been reducing the money supply. And I guess most people talk about, when we talk about restrictive monetary policy, we talk about increasing rates, and we also talk about reducing the Fed's balance sheet, because their balance sheet grew enormously. I mean, over, you know, doubled, COVID yeah. and more, yeah. So when we talk about reducing inflation, um, we, we, we also say that it, the third part, the government needs to reduce its spending, which isn't happening. And um, so with that in mind, um, do you think it's important that they reduce their balance sheet as well as rate hike to help bring down the inflation? Yeah, uh, because the balance sheet, I mean, you can see that there's just I mean, there's $2 trillion that goes into the reverse repo facility every day. Yeah. I mean, basically, that tells you that there's just nowhere else to put it. Um, and 
that's part of the problem. There's still too much liquidity, mm -hmm. still exactly. too much money yeah. in the system. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes apparent like when you get these, you know, when you get these oddball rallies in certain parts of the market, right? That just mm -hmm. seem to spurt out of nowhere. Like what happened in Bitcoin recently, right? Yeah. Or that Pepe. <laughs> Did you hear about Pepe? Yeah. I was like, yeah. what's that? I didn't know. I don't know. I, I don't I know like, anything about it. It's. I just see a frog and I didn't know what it was, but supposedly it went up tremendously. I guess I've been living under a rock. And I don't know. Right. But I saw that. <laughs> um. So I, I, I just, I just tend to think that there's still too much liquidity out there. Mm -hmm. They need to, you know, reduce liquidity, but more importantly, they really need to, you know, get this, demand side of this equation back into balance. And, you know, obviously if the government continues to spend mm -hmm. and there's continues to, you know, that's going to create more inflationary pressures yes. as well, because it's going to keep demand elevated as opposed to allowing it to cool exactly. off. And, you know, a lot of people only focus, I, I don't, I don't know why it is, but you see a lot of people only focusing on half the problem. Mm -hmm. which is the falling money supply. And that's not really, that's not, a, it's only half the equation. And the fact that it's declining is actually, you know, not good in the sense that it's not going to bring inflation down. That's a very important point. Um, and a lot of people talk about reducing balance sheet as the same as reducing money supply. And um, could you just tell us all the differences and the meanings to you and how, and I love what you just said, how um, it actually, when you show it with the velocity equation, you it shows how that actually increases inflation. So if you could just tell us about those differences. So the balance sheet is sort of, um, if you look at the Fed balance sheet, it's made up of like a couple of things, right? right? The first obvious thing is the treasury holdings. Mm -hmm. And then it has its MBS holdings. And then it has its currency in circulation. And it has its, um, the reverse repo facility portions and, you know, credit lines and swaps. And, um, but that's sort of like a separate animal in a way, because mm -hmm. the, I mean, really what's happening is the treasury is issuing bonds. Uh, the Fed goes into the market and buys those bonds and then, you know, pays back the treasury. It's almost like a a Ponzi scheme type of thing, right? <laughs> I didn't want to say it like that. I love that. You know what? The whole, the Bitcoin crowd, that's exactly what they call it. It's a Ponzi yeah. scheme. So In a way, I mean, that's yeah. what it is, you know? It's like yeah. A, and, um but the money supply is more of, you know, bank liabilities, right? Mm -hmm. The, you know, money in checking accounts, the money in in retail money market accounts, the money in, you know, KEO accounts and IRA accounts and that stuff. And so what you're really seeing is that bank liabilities are declining and they're going into money market funds, which are then being reinvested into the reverse repo facility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... And so, and then the Fed's paying interest on those, on that reverse repo facility, right? Yeah. And so it's interesting because the M2 is kind of coming down and at the same time, you know, it's flowing into institutional money market accounts, which actually is in part of MZM. So that number hasn't come down quite as much. Mm -hmm. and, and And so like the whole thing to me just seems like what we need to kind of because it's just like one big circular reference at the yeah. end of the day money's going to go somewhere mm -hmm. and it, if it's not going to be here it's going to be here right yeah. you're not destroying it, right the only way you really get money to be destroyed is to have the value of that asset or the value of assets decline and so you know if people put money in into the market or they put it into their homes or they put it into some sort of cryptocurrency or some sort of asset the value of the asset declines, that's destroying, you know, yes. some of the money at least because there's always, the, the and, and so, mm -hmm. right. And so that's really what needs to happen more of to really get rid of those, that excess liquidity that's in the system. I, I just don't, 
I mean, the more it was kind of taking place when you saw financial conditions really tightening and you saw asset prices coming down last year. Mm -hmm. But that sort of has stopped. And so now you're getting this build up in money market accounts because, you know, the, the bond bank bank rates are so bad. Mm -hmm. And so it's just recirculating to another part of the economy. It, it just seems like it's gonna, it's a process that's just not going to go away very quickly. Exactly. Agree. Uh, I love the way you explain that. You're like a, you're a great teacher. Um, and, you know, it's important to explain it for everyone because these words get used interchangeably and very loosely. So it's important that we understand how that all works. And it's funny how you say it's a Ponzi scheme, but it does sound the way it works. I mean, how the money just moves in a circle like that does sound like that. And I agree with you. I think that we need to see some type of devaluation of these assets. And housing is the first one we think about. You know, there was a huge rise in the price of homes and especially in the COVID hotbed areas. And uh, it would be, I think, healthy to see some pullback on this and those pricings. And then, you know, we talk about equities and I love your charts and how you talk about, um, you know, the P.E. ratio and the earnings estimates. And we look at the earnings yield and we see that, you know, the risk free rate in the three month, I think, I think is a great return. I think it's like five, over five. And then like the one month is five, three. And that return is higher than the earnings yield for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So then I start thinking that's expensive. And, you know, as we get into this discussion about the valuation of assets, I think that needs to come down too. So um, I'd like to talk about your thoughts on the P.E. ratio and where you think the um, S&P should be at um, with these earnings that we're seeing right now. Well, I mean, to some degree, the reason why you've seen the multiple on the S&P remain around this 19 number mm -hmm. is, I think, number one, because the market doesn't believe that rates are going to stay where they are. Yeah, I think it believes that rates are going to come down, and that's going to result in, in those imbalances in sort of sorting themselves out. The other problem, I think, is that Again, there's still too much liquidity in the system yes. by about $2 trillion, which is just sort of allowing the market to levitate uh, because it's just there's just too much speculation still, right? Like a typical bear market is when you don't want to ever buy a stock again, right? Because you've been destroyed. Uh, not that you're trying to play the last rate hike and trying to play the Fed pivot, right? Mm -hmm. Markets don't, the Fed doesn't do something because the market is trying to get ahead of it. It's usually because the market is forcing the Fed to do it, right? And that's just how it's always been. So a rising market isn't going to incentivize the Fed to do anything. And basically what that tells you is that there's still too much speculation in the market, right? Um, and that there's too much liquidity still in the system. So that's also sort of keeping multiples elevated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when it's all said and done, you know, a level where I would want to see the market trading is closer to 16, mm -hmm. 15, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would want a washout to come somewhere in the 12 to 14 range on a PE. Mm hmm it's just, it might take a while longer before that actually happens. Um, and so, and the only way that kind of happens is by getting some of that destruction of excess liquidity. And again, that just hasn't happened yet. And, and so, you know, what does it, what is it ultimately going to take for mm -hmm. that to happen is yes. you're going to need to see you know, the reverse repo facilities start heading towards zero mm -hmm. uh, because what's happening is, is that the Fed's QT program is continuing to unwind. The money that the Fed, you know, created with QE is going back to the treasury and kind of being, mm -hmm. you know, destroyed um, or that uh, we're being taken out of the system at least, or you're going to need to see more asset losses, right? And mm -hmm. And that may mean rates actually have to go higher. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I agree. 
Um, you know, I want to ask you what you're doing in the market. You know, we're all this talk about, I mean, I also believe that PE should be about 16, 15. Um, but you know, the market can be irrational. Um, however, yeah. on a dime, it could, it could go the other way and pull down to the 3,600, 3,700, who knows, you know, who knows what range it could be in. It just needs some type of little catalyst. Um, so what are, what have you been doing lately? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, me I, too, actually. I, I haven't, I haven't, the last stock I bought was Amazon in October. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and all I've done, uh, since then is sell things. Yeah. Um, I sold uh, Roblox in December. I sold Splunk in the very beginning of February. And I sold uh, a, a small cap called Veridime, MDRX, uh, mm. towards the uh, beginning of April, I think. Um, so I'm still carrying about 35% uh, of my portfolio in cash. Um, and I'm just waiting and being patient. I, I mean my investments from last year that I bought, I bought Shopify and intuitive surgical, Amazon, Boeing, you know, they've all done well mm -hmm. for me pretty much. Uh, plus I already owned positions in Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Visa, MasterCard, to name Great a few. I, I, I keep like, a, I, I keep my portfolio small, maybe nine ish, 10 names right now. Um, and I'm happy with the way they've done obviously. And, Hey, I mean, if I can, I think, you know, if I can be up 10 to 12% as of this point in this year, in this environment, I'm with 35% of my portfolio in cash. I'm, I'm more than happy with that. Love it. I agree. I've, uh, I've held on to my longs as well. SMCI, we've talked about that one. I've mentioned it every time I think, um, and yeah. I took profits recently when it went, I mean, Hey, went to 136. you know, you can't complain. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, me too. I've been doing very minimal. Um, and, you know, what's the point? It's, a, it's been a sideways market. The S&P, I think we're back, we're about the same level as like March or something like that. It's sideways. And we've been in this range. And, you know, um, I'm also long term. So, you know, um, sometimes it's best to do nothing. And you hold that cash, you have that liquidity, you know, it's important to remain liquid to seize those opportunities. I always believe you make your money on the buy side when you buy. And I've been saying that forever. I mean, I learned that in real estate. And so, you know, you want to buy right. And you know, from doing this so long since the 90s, um, that, you know, you want to buy cheap, you want to buy low. And that's the goal. It's not to, you know, try to catch this little, you know, it's about risk and reward. Um, I mean, you want so. to buy when nobody else wants to buy. Exactly. You know, when you buy when it's really like you got to force yourself to do it. Exactly. You know, because um, again, like markets, the market is just not acting rationally at this point. And mm -hmm. there's no, again, like, you know, my feeling is, is like, if you're going up with the market or outperforming the market with a good cash buffer, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Exactly. Um, you want to make you want to make smart choices. You don't want to make stupid mistakes. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I love that. You know, the money market pays, I think, over four percent. You got yeah. the T bills. I mean, I've been doing ladders with the monthly, uh, the four week T bill, and you need to stay liquid. And you have what five and change. I mean, hey, you know that that's pretty awesome. And um, so it's all about the risk reward and, you know, they're called risk-free rate for a reason. So um, that you could just let the money just sit there. So it's much higher than it's been since, since I think I, we had this discussion before as well, since uh, pre, you know, GFC. I mean, this is the highest it's been um, in a very long time. You know, I want to talk about the inversion of the yield curve. You have this excellent chart that you post um, frequently about the 18 month forward. Um, could you show us that or just at least talk about it and tell yeah, sure. us what you're seeing there? I think the spread has gotten rather low. I think it's at the highest it's been at this cycle. It, it was, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't, don't know if it is as of right now. Okay. When you posted it, it was, I recall that. Yes. Um, so this is a spread between the 10, to, this is the 210 spread 
mm -hmm. uh, 18 month forward curve. And um, right now it's uh, about 38 basis points. So right about here. Okay. So it's down just a little bit, but the high got up to around 43, 45 basis points or so. And um, what this curve is, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like what the bond market thinks rates will be 18 months from now. Mm -hmm. And um, what I like about it is that it, it, it sort of moves a little bit faster than the traditional 10-2 curve. Mm -hmm. And that here you can see that the, the 10, this is the orange line is the 210 curve, right? Mm -hmm. And the green line is the, is the spread is the 18 month forward curve. Yeah. You have the coolest charts. I have to tell you, Michael, <laughs> I, I love your charts and how you find these patterns. It's just fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, I was looking at this and it, it just seems to me like this forward curve tends to bottom and begin to turn higher slightly before the spot curve. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I like it. And typically when the curve starts to really rise, um, you can see it here more, more so uh, where you can start really seeing yeah. it started to rise a little bit before this one. Um, and so what I like about it is that once it really starts to rise, materially mm -hmm. it's usually when the equity market is like just toast yeah um my my feeling has always been you know it's not when the yield curve inverts that you need to worry it's when it steepens that you need to worry mm -hmm. um and we're at the point in time where the 10 2 is you know negative 50 on the spot but a positive 40 base basis points or so on the on the forward and what this sort of implies to me is that you know if this spread continues to widen, it typically would be with, you know, a rising unemployment rate. Um, but one of the reasons why you haven't seen, you know, the spread, is that the unemployment rate? No, sorry. Um, the, the um, But one of the reasons why you've seen this curve kind of really take a long time to really begin to steepen too, mm -hmm. is because the unemployment rate has remained so low. Mm -hmm. And you really haven't begun to see the unemployment rate rise at a at a steady pace. Once that happens, you're going to see this curve really begin to move up, and that will be your signal that it's um, it's pretty much lights out, right? That the economy is going to head into a recession, and you know the equity market is pretty much toast, right? Um, and it it happens on a regular sort of basis. You can see. It didn't happen so much in 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 2020 because it was mm -hmm. a little bit of a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. But you can clearly see it here, where the 10-2 curve, 18 months forward, started to rise. You know, call it in uh, September of 18, while the 10-2 spot curve was actually still falling. And that was when we had our big sell-off. And then the only reason why it didn't continue to rise, or at least it went down a little bit more, was because before COVID, was because the Fed changed courses so generally speaking my my thought process here is that i'm watching this to see if it continues to start really rising at a regular clip once that happens i think that's pretty much your signal that something is gonna really break mm -hmm. yep wow i love this chart this is uh very informative um so Per this chart, what is it telling us about expectations 18 months from now? Um, right now, what is it saying? To it's us? telling you that your spreads are going to be positive, right? That mm -hmm. the yield curve is going to be inverted anymore. And that you should be at least 40 basis points higher wow. uh, on it, right? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it's just basically saying that Probably at that point in time, you're going to see a higher unemployment rate. Wow. Wow. It's telling us a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's been a slow process. And like we discussed, we could probably see uh, stagflationary conditions and potentially a recession into 2024, which is about 12 months, is what, nine months away? Um, and then 18 months be like towards the end of next year. Um, interesting stuff. 
Wow. This yeah, is I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at this, I mean, I mean, typically you can see here that look at that. Yeah. To like about positive 70 basis points, 65 to 70 basis yeah. points. That's usually when the recession, at least off of these two examples, started. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. this is really kind of I wish you could just delete this period of time. Right. <laughs> this, it really just messed up things from a charting and, and economic standpoint in terms of understanding things. But mm-hmm. you can't. Right. So but I mean, if you look at these periods of time, it's like once you get to around this 65 to 70 basis points on the spread mm-hmm. you're in the recession. Right. And so exactly. it's, you're not really that far away. You aren't. You aren't. That's right. Wow. Great but one to watch. This could drag out for more. This could drag out for several months before we get that high again. We we just don't know. The only thing I do know is that this number is. What I do know is that it, it seems to focus a lot on the job market. Uh, and specifically, it also seems to focus a lot on the ISM services and manufacturing data. It seems like a lot of the biggest moves have come on days where you've seen the unemployment rate rise more than expected, or you've seen weaker than expected ISM services data or manufacturing data. Mm. Interesting. Like I think, uh, yeah, these dates were the third and the fourth. This was the fifth, right? Which is the Mm -hmm. the employment. uh, These dates were like the JOLTS reports and the ISM data. Yes, you're right. You could see Mm-hmm. They were not those days. Interesting. So that's sort of, you know, how I've been looking at the data and thinking about it. Mm, this was also speaking. probably around. This was also around that first week of April as well. You can see the big move up came at the first week of April. Mm-hmm. Wow, I think ISM was in there somewhere. Yeah, <clears throat> right in that area. So, wow. Yeah. Great I'm points. sort of, but I'm sort of focused on on this. Absolutely. Uh, I agree. I think it makes a lot of sense. Definitely one to watch. Um, Let's throw in the debt ceiling discussion. Do you think that's all overblown as well? Or do you think there's some substance there? Uh, I don't think it's overblown. I think it's a potential problem Mm. that the equity market is just not paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if we look at the one year US CDS. Yeah, look at that one. you know, it's up that. there 156. Mm-hmm. So it's certainly not where it as high as it was. But you can see this is 2008, 2009. This is 2011, 2013, right? And if we look mm-hmm. at the US five year CDS, yes, those um, are the two to watch. Look you know, at here that. we are. This is, you know, 2008, 2009 back here. So, mm. Uh, the, the credit market clearly has a differing view of, about this, right, than what the equity market does. And what's interesting is, is that if you take the, the VIX and you lay it underneath, um, what you'll see is that, you know, the VIX, I mean, it's not perfect, but you can see certainly that when there are spikes in the CDS, mm-hmm. there's usually spikes in the VIX that tend to go along with it, uh, but not right here, of course. Yeah, what what's going on? I was going to ask, that's what I wanted to talk about, the VIX discussion. I have to say you had a fantastic video, and I think everyone needs to check out your YouTube channel, uh, Moss Capital. I'm going to put that in the description, um, that you show, you actually talk about the zero DTE people affecting the VIX, and the you look at now the one-day volatility um, to help you decipher all that, um, why the VIX is so low. So um, I would love that discussion as well. Um, so the, the VIX one day index right now is is fairly new. It just came out a couple of... Um, and you're on it right away. <laughs> yeah, we, it came out maybe a week or two ago. And um, what I've been using it for is to figure out really, you know, what's happening with implied volatility mm-hmm. during the day, right? And And not so much where it's expected to be, you know, or what the market's thinking about 30 days from now mm-hmm. and interaction with, you know, stock prices overall. And um, what's sort of interesting is that 
you know, here you can see, if we go back over the last six days, let's say. Um, <clears throat> Interesting that you're noticing a pattern of the IV rising before a fundamental event, and then it comes right, down. Like, so right. it, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, this was, you know, May 2nd. So that was uh, before the Fed meeting. Mm -hmm. You can see that IV going into the Fed meeting was very elevated. Yeah. And then coming out of the meeting, it, it declined. Uh, and the market declined too, which is interesting. You typically, when you see implied volatility decline, you typically see stocks go up, mm -hmm. right? So that sort of tells you that there's a lot, there must have been a lot of selling pressure that day. Then you can see on Thursday, this was the day before the job report, IV was very elevated going back to nearly its highs at the BLS job report. And then once that job report came out, it got, wow. high volatility got crushed. It resulted in stocks spiking. Um, and you can see basically when you get something where you have implied volatility rising at the same time as prices, mm -hmm. it's usually indicative of a gamma squeeze. There's like a grab for calls and so what happens mm -hmm. is, is the implied volatility begins to increase now what's interesting today is that you can see implied volatility is rising going into tomorrow's cpi although it's mm -hmm. still very low relative to where it's been right if you look at where we were here versus where we are here um and so what this is telling you is that let's say we get uh an inline report tomorrow and you see the vix come back down to let's say 10 chances are you're not going to get the same type of move in the market that you got following the job report because here mm -hmm. you went from 21 to 13. So it moved from 13 to back at the lower end of range. 10 is not going to give you the same impact, right? But what's interesting too is that you can see that implied volatility is going up, but yet the market really isn't selling off all that much, which mm -hmm. could be a sign that you have people speculating and looking to buy calls uh, potential upside. That's how I would sort of look at that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. And what I'm thinking is what I've been reading is that, you know, the people believe it's going to be a pause upcoming. I think there's enough news out there that they believe the Fed will pause. So they may think that this report, um, I mean, that's why the IV maybe isn't as high. Um, they're thinking that this report will be in line or maybe lower. We've had a pattern of deceleration of inflation. So um, an interesting pattern that you've seen, and it's almost like there's an unwinding of the hedging that occurs, like there's a hedging that occurs beforehand with that right. higher IV, and then you see an unwinding of it, which is what caused that rally, because we had a rally on Friday after yeah. this jobs report, which I didn't think, I thought it was a very tight labor market. Um, I don't think it was that great of a, a report. Um, even though they revised, I think they ended up revising or something to the positive. Uh, but yeah. yeah, it was, um, but we saw that rally. So I think this helps explain the rally, you think? Yeah, I think this adds another layer of visibility into the market that really wasn't mm -hmm. present before. I mean, unless you had specific tools, it was really hard to do that. Like I could, I was still able to see it because I have other tools at my disposal yeah. where I can track, you know, intraday vol implied wow. volatility for certain options, but you don't really, you don't get it wow, to the same mm -hmm. sort of, this was, this was today. I don't know why it would have spiked today. Then there was a big decline in it, but. Mm. Um, what chart is you, this one? This is the S and P 500 uh, May 9th. Mm. uh 4130 calls ah, okay. and what it's showing you is the implied volatility for that contract um but you can see here's uh you know here it is right here 8 15 in the morning and then look at where the implied volatility is after the open right it just came crashing down and here's you know here's your fed meeting it was rising going up into the fed meeting and then came came down right so it's the same sort of data it's just disseminated differently and it's kind of put together in a different way. Love it. You are the master of charts for sure. So Michael, let's take all this discussion we had. We had the debt ceiling, which 
you said, is it concern, especially looking at that, um, the credit default swaps, um, at, I mean, the highs it's been since, you know, 2008 with that five year, and that's concerning, um, definitely concerning. Then you have, uh, oh, the sluice report. We didn't talk about that. Let's touch upon the sluice report. Um, and there were only 63 banks that participated. That was pretty low. What are your thoughts on what you saw over there? I don't really know what to make of it, to be quite honest. It's, um, I guess, conditions tightened a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems clear that demand has slowed. Um, again, it's just hard for me to determine if conditions really tightened all that much. First of all, they don't look like they tightened very much. And then secondly, it's like you're missing, you know, you didn't have the same number of banks participating. So to me, it's like, okay, well, 54% or whatever the number was, 46% of the mm -hmm. banks said they were tightening standards versus 44 last month. But if you maybe you had the same number of people participating, maybe those numbers wouldn't have changed. Exactly. You know, it's like you're taking a percentage of a smaller percentage of the pie. So it's, it made the numbers sort of go up. But again, I don't really know that there was really all that much credit tightening as much as everyone wants exactly. to make the it, credit crunch, it right? Work. That yeah. credit, cr I think they like the word. It, it's like Captain Crunch. It doesn't, credit crunch. it doesn't seem like there is, but again, I mean, you can't make much out of one data point. Exactly. And unfortunately, you won't get it for another three months again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't put too much weight in that. And then there were a lot of talk yeah. on Twitter about that. They're saying uh, this is showing signs of a hard landing or, or other things like that. I think it's also a small I mean, sample. It, it may be, but again, it's when will the hard landing be? You know, when, you know, these things all sort of matter to some degree because, you know, markets are, you know, trading constantly. And so as of right now, I don't have enough information to say that there'll be a hard landing. And that that certainly, that data didn't confirm that to me that there would be. Yes, we saw the small business report came out today um, and that didn't look good at all. I think it came in below and that was pretty bad. And, you know, small businesses are more sensitive to, you know, higher cost of goods and services, um, you know, cost of goods sold and, you know, operating expenses. We have margin compression. That's the bottom line. Um, reduction in productivity and, you know, higher cost of debt and capital um, affects them much harder than the larger caps and larger corporations. So we're seeing them get hit. Um, and I think it's just part of this economic cycle that we're in um, and it will take time and it's a long process. So Michael, look at all these things we discussed, okay? Um, you know, from, you know, the, you know, earnings, you know, the debt ceiling, liquidity is still very high. Let's throw them all into a, a spinner. And let's see, what is your best case scenario versus worst case scenario um, in the future? Um, in terms of pricing or? In terms of the market, um, the economy, anything. Just what when you start thinking, I love your thinking process. And I think it's so awesome. You're, you're, you're one of my favorites by far. Um, you're, I told you, I'm, I'm the head of the Michael Kramer fan, fan club. Uh, I'm the president. Um, and I love your thinking process and your chart analysis. And I just like to know when you look at everything, because you look at many charts that you don't always post because you're just going through them and you're looking for pattern recognition and um, you have great pattern matching. What are your thoughts for the, let's, let's start with the worst case scenario. Where do you see the S&P and where do you see things going? Um, so the worst case scenario would be a hard landing. The Fed has to cut aggressively. That would probably result in the S&P 500 trading down to, I would say, probably below 3,000. You'd Ooh. see significant multiple contraction. You would see significant earnings declines. Um, and I think that would be the worst case scenario. The the sort of my sort of hopeful scenario and optimistic mm -hmm. scenario mm -hmm. is sort of just a period of stagflationary growth where we're just growing between zero and one percent a year and we're kind of chiseling away at getting that inflation rate down, uh, which will mean that the equity market sort of stays, you know, uh 
probably range bound, but I think at some point we're going to probably be trading closer to the lower end of the range, which is that 35 ish to 3,600 area. Um, but again, the way that the market sort of works is that we know it always overdoes it to the upside and overdoes it to the downside. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't be surprised again, that we don't see some sort of spike in some sort of capitulatory moment that sees the S and P 500 even trade down to as low as 3,200. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that that would create an amazing opportunity to really get long and, you know, because again, I think ultimately if we just stay in a stagflationary environment and inflation naturally comes down on its own and you avoid that, that really hard landing, I think you could come out of it where you'll actually have the opportunity for businesses to rebound more quickly and you can get probably some margin expansion, which will help to lead to higher multiples in the longer term. Exactly. I love that. Well said. Now, the best case scenario, I'm just going to repeat um, because that's important. We like to focus on the positive. Your mm -hmm. best case scenario is still about 3,500 to 3,600 range, correct? Yeah, I, I think that the, well, I mean, the best case scenario is this trading range, right? Where we yes. just kind of stay between 3,500 and 4,200 and just kind of go back and forth between that upper and lower bound. I think it, it could be that type of environment for maybe a year or so before yeah. this is all said and done um, again. But I, I think that's only if we're going to stay in a stagflationary environment. I, I just mm -hmm. don't, I just don't see how you can get out of this with the fed cutting rates uh, and then mm -hmm. taking off again. It just doesn't, yeah. it just doesn't yeah. make sense. You know, there's, there's, this isn't, you know, 2020 where we're going to get QE and massive rate cuts and all this fiscal spending. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not the way it's going to work. I don't think this time. Exactly. I agree with you. I think the similar scenario, we're not, you know, it's a, it's a recency bias, you know, to think that we're going to go back to that time period, which to me was like an anomaly. It was a very strange time period. I mean, it was COVID and, um, and I don't think we're going to go back to that environment. So with that in mind, um, I think that it's very plausible, as you said, I think a sideways market, and that's why we're not rushing, you know, we're remaining patient and remaining liquid and, um, you know, just seeing how things unfold. So what's going on right now? Why are we trending on this high end of this range? 4,100. I mean, I guess the earnings were better than expected. Um, but you think it's based on the earnings? Do you think it's um, something else? Is it that we were oversold? Is it technically based? So what are your thoughts on what's going on right now? And what's going to cause it to change, do you think, to go back to the other end of the spectrum? I, I think we've just been sort of in this environment where you're going to have, you know, a soft landing, inflation's just going to melt away. Yeah, fantasy land. And that's going to allow the Fed to just start aggressively cutting rates and getting them back down to a lower number. And I, I think that as long as that optimism is present, you can see the equity market stay in this 41 to 4,200 range. I mean, we could find out as soon as tomorrow whether or not that's going to continue to persist because the inflation swap market right now has inflation going from like 5% in April to like 3% in June. June, right? I saw that. And, yeah. I mean, uh, whoa. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the year over year comps may allow that to happen, right? The base effects may allow that to happen. But, you know, you get one bad report tomorrow, you get a number that comes in hotter than expected, and you get a, let's say, a 5.6 or 5.7% 5 core, and it's going up instead of coming down, and you get a 5.3% headline CPI or something, and all of a sudden, all that may go out the window, right? Mm -hmm. And and so that, that obviously could change things rather dramatically. But I think, you know, and, and then, of course, you continue to get data that's supportive of the idea that the Fed may have to raise rates more, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, and, and so, again, in a stagflation environment, which is what I think we're in, mm -hmm. 
you know, where you have persistently high nominal GDP growth driven by higher prices, the Fed's not going to cut rates. And so that may actually result in the Fed having to go higher than what people think right now. And so that's really the big risk, right? Is that all of a sudden the market wakes up and says, you know what? We're not going to have a soft landing, but we're not going to have a hard landing either. And that means we're not going to get any sort of rate cuts. And really the risk is still to the upside in rates. That's really the big, that's the big question. And I think that that right now is not being factored in. I think if we go back to being having that idea factored in, that the Fed may not be done and that, you know, inflation mm -hmm. is going to be up here a little bit longer than we all think, then the market will go back to the lower end of the trading range. Excellent. Well said. You're so, you're, and, and, that was, and to be that was truthful, great. Mm -hmm. And to be truthful, all you need is oil to go up back to $90 a barrel and that whole, you know, that's mm -hmm. what that's what's been lowering the inflation rate is oil and gasoline. Exactly. You know, you push oil and gasoline prices up for two or three months, you know, going into the summer. I mean, you could have inflation back at six or seven percent in a heartbeat. Exactly. And there are a lot of people talking about a potential reacceleration uh, with that same exact argument. Um, right. So very well said. I, I um, that's that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, I yeah. love it. <laughs> that was really great. Um, I think that it can change rather dramatically. And it's like when people least expect it, and that's how it works. And if you're expecting something to happen, um, then you're preparing. But if you expect that the Fed is going to pause and or maybe even cut, like the market seems to believe, um, and then we get a hot report, um, and then all of a sudden we say, oh, the Fed's going to keep raising, that will be a real shock to the system. And that's where we could see, you know, sub 4,000 and go back to the other side of the range. Um, I mean, honestly, if you had gotten that job report, if that job report had came next month instead of this month, and it was one week before the Fed meeting, as opposed to six weeks before the next Fed meeting, the market wouldn't have even blink, you'd be probably, you know, 5% lower by now. Exactly. Wow. Great. I always love talking to you, Michael, you bring, you know, some, you know, reality to all this discussion. And, um, you know, you definitely uh, the voice of reason here. So love meeting up with you. Anything else you want to mention that I may have left out? Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. We did. We did great today. So Ready tell to everyone, it. tell everyone about your new sub stack. I love it. Tell everyone about it. So I started a sub stack, uh, reading the markets dot sub stack dot com. Uh, basically, it's just, you know, the same thing I'm trying to provide in on Seeking Alpha platform. But I'm just trying to, again, uh, expand the audience because I know not everyone uh, may have a Seeking Alpha account or, or be on the platform. So again, it's just trying to, you know, uh, find reach to some uh, other people that may be interested in it and, you know, kind of expand it outside because really what drove it was that I was tired of maintaining my own website. And uh, the, the idea of going to Substack just created a very easy way for me to transition away from my own website. Very nice. Well, I love it. And I'm definitely going to be one of your top readers um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, oh, one last question. I do remember something I, I want to ask you. We're talking about stagflation so much. And so when people think of stagflation, they go back to the 70s, 80s, and they think of gold. Are you a bull on gold? Um, Not really. I, I've never really been a fan of gold. Um, you know, a lot of where gold will go will depend on, uh, where the dollar is and where, uh, rates are, obviously the higher rates are that kind of hurts gold. And obviously if the dollar doesn't decline, then that's going to hurt gold as well. The problem is, is that if the U S was in stagflation alone and the value of the dollar was declining, then you can make a case for gold. But unfortunately, we're all sort of in the same environment. And so what that means is that the dollar really won't devalue too much because, you know, it's going to probably hold some value versus mm -hmm. the euro and the yen and all those yes. other things. 
So it's not really going to allow for that massive devaluation of the dollar that so many people think. And so then you really won't see gold respond in a positive way. Love it. Brilliant. Exactly. Well, I am actually, in the, I do believe that U.S. dollar will remain the global reserve currency. I mean, there's no other contender, you know, euro and the yuan. I mean, there's nothing that is as stable and liquid as the dollar. So until that changes, the GRC is the U.S. dollar. So right. I think on that note, we can wrap. And I definitely look forward to meeting with you again. Thank you so much, Michael Kramer. You're the best. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Rose Show podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon. All investment, real estate, financial, legal, and tax opinions expressed by Rosanna Prestia or on the Rose Show should not be relied upon as professional advice and are intended to be used for informational purposes only.